right, we will call the meeting to order at 6.34 p.m. And uh, we'll start with the roll call, Rita. Sure. Um, Commissioner Bottenberg? Present. Commissioner Van Ness? Here. Uh, Commissioner Hall? Present. Commissioner Mayer? Present. Commissioner Gano? Here. Um, Commissioner Bernack um, sent his apologies um, last week, and I believe Commissioner Nishioka is going to be joining us at seven. Okay. Our first matter of business is the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay. Do you have the I official mic flag? I do, because Mike is not here, so I am. Just hold your horses. Let me find the flag. Um, can you all see the flag? You see yes. the RB? Yes. Okay, fabulous. All right. Stan? Yes, ma'am. Would you lead us? I will. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. And the approval of the agenda comes next. Do we have a motion to accept the agenda? So moved. That's a Terry? Yes. Okay, do we have a second? Second. Oh. Who's that? Nushina. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Okay, the motion's made to accept the agenda as presented. All those in favor, raise your hand so I can see you. Aye. Okay, Aye. thank you. And then we will work, move to the approval of the minutes of the, good heavens, what do I have here? I think I got the minutes from the last meeting. <laughs> um, okay, so the minutes of the June 9th meeting. Do we have the motion to accept the minutes? This is Stan. I make a motion to accept the minutes as written. Okay, do we have a second? A second. Thank you, Julie. Okay, the minutes have been... Uh, yeah, the motion has been made to accept the minutes as distributed. All those in favor say yes or raise your hand. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right, All right the minutes pass unanimously. Okay, do we have any public comment? Chat, we do not. Rita, do you want to take the flag down? Okay, I'm so sorry. Look at this. Uh, let me just bear with me. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Stop sharing. Can you see? Is that okay now? Yep, we get all back. Look at that. Okay. okay. So no public comment. So moving right along. Our first part of the business here is to uh, welcome you all. And so um, just a little bit about what the commission does. We recommend to the city council on topics such as development of human services in Sammamish, determination of human services priorities, human service grants and funding requests, and emerging human services issues or concerns. And I'd like to have the members introduce themselves and their a little bit of their background for you, the benefit of our panel. Uh, Jody is not here yet. Nushina, can you? Hi, everyone. I'm Nushina Meir. Um, I've been with the commission for almost three years, and I work at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I've been with the foundation for almost 10 years. Um, prior to that, um, I worked at another foundation focused on um, U.S. higher education issues and was in academia for a while and have also held positions in various nonprofits. So I'm very committed to um, the work that the commission does and have worked in many of our priority areas such as mental health and domestic violence, um, among other areas. Thank you. Stan? 
had to make sure my mic wasn't muted. Um, Stan Gano, I retired from the Air Force, moved to Sammamish December 95. Um, I, since retiring, I've started a nonprofit for military sexual trauma victims that turned into a, um, it, it morphed into a bigger uh, situation. So I'm off the board of directors for that now. Um, I am the judge advocate for the disabled American veterans here in the state of Washington and have been on the commission, uh, well, since the task force went away and the commission started. I don't remember what year it was. I guess I'm getting old. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where I'm at. Uh, I'm now retired, so focusing on giving back a little bit more to the community if I can. Thank you. Thank Terry? you. Uh, good evening again. Um, I'm Terry Hall. I've been on the commission just a little bit less than a year and a half. Um, my day job, I'm a, a lawyer who's um, uh, working towards retirement, which is a work in progress, but perhaps I've been a resident of Sammamish since 91, um, or at least been up on the plateau since 91. Um, probably the most pertinent experience I have. I've been very active over the years in Friends of Youth, serving as a board member and a board chair, and uh, like Stan, uh, looking, f uh, looking for opportunities to contribute to the community. Thank you. And Julie? Hi, everybody. I'm Julie Barnes. Uh, I'm new to the commission this year. I started in uh, February. And let's see, uh, my family and I, we've lived up on the plateau uh, since 1994. <laughs> So longtime residents raised my both my kids here and really um, think this is a vibrant and um, excellent community for families and love to keep it that way. And so that's why I volunteered for this commission, because I feel like, um, you know, the city putting money towards human services and, and finding the needs where that are not so obvious is is really important. Um, my background is accounting and finance, uh, but I've also served on the board at uh, UC, UCSI Services and a few other uh, local nonprofits. But thank you for being here tonight. And I'm Joyce Plottenberg. I've lived on the plateau since 86. And um, my career background has been primarily in nonprofits. In this end of the country, it's been with the uh, Medical and Foundation, uh, Epilepsy Association, and Boys and Girls Club and the Starlight Children's Foundation. And I'm um, looking forward to having you with us tonight. I want to give you some more background about our, our commission. We've completed a year-long professional citywide health and human services needs assessment with the Burke Group beginning in 2017 and was presented to the City Council in March of 2018. Um, five priority areas were identified as basic needs, mental wellness, active seniors, cultural inclusion, and domestic violence. We really um, appreciate having you with us tonight so we can get your insight on so much because you see so much in the communities that we we live in here. Um, and we didn't introduce Rita. Dear Rita, who are you? Well, hello, good evening, everyone. My name is Rita Bard. I'm the staff liaison for this fabulous commission. Um, I like to say that we're the smartest commission in the city, but don't tell anyone that. Um, and uh, yes, um, I serve at the pleasure of the commission and, uh, and I work in human services at the city. So thank you all for um, attending. We're so looking forward to hearing what you have to say. And uh, just a little bit of insight from the rest of our panel there. Could you tell us a little bit about yourselves, how long you've been in the role you are, and then we'll proceed into the, what you're bringing to us tonight. Um, I'm looking and I see Jessica Martin up top, Matt. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I, my IT skills are a little off, so you're on my daughter's account. Uh, I've been with Sammamish a little over a year, uh, King County Sheriff's Office, uh, a bit over nearly three years. Um, you might have noticed 
I don't have a local accent. I was a police officer in Australia for a long time. My wife works at Microsoft. Uh, in, in she worked there in Sydney and was offered a job here. Uh, so we packed up and moved here. Um, I love being a police officer more than I like doing anything else. So I simply started again and was fortunate to land at King County. And then this when this job came up at, uh, sorry, I'm the school resource officer now at Eastlake High School. When that came up, it was exactly the same year that my daughter was going into the school. And um, so I took that job. Unfortunately, uh, COVID ruins everything. So I've been, a, a, haven't been much of a school resource officer for that period. Um, I was much more involved in policing in Sammamish with a little bit of part-time school. Um, but even the small amount I got to do, I really enjoyed. I'm looking forward to the kids coming back. Uh, that's about it. Thanks. Thank you. We have a very international group today with Australian, yeah. British and Indian accents represented, I guess. <laughs> we, we, might. we got England over there and Rita. <laughs> We might start talking about cricket and then that will exclude yeah, all the Exactly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie? Well, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for allowing us to join today. Uh, my name is Jamie Formasano and I work for Eastside Fire and Rescue. I work at our headquarters building and I am the program administrator for our Core Connect program, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, my dad was in the military for 26 years, so we moved around, I don't know, every two to four years. Uh, I went to high school in Issaquah, um, graduated in 95, and it feels really, really great to be back serving the communities um, of Eastside Fire and Rescue. Issaquah is one of those communities along with Spanish. Um, I've been in the fire service for over 12 years now and over five years here at Eastside Fire and Rescue. And I adore my job. I love it so much. So I'm looking forward to sharing about our program with you. And our sergeant. Ooh, I figured out how to unmute. Um, so I'm Christine Elias. I am the administrative sergeant in the city of Sammamish. And I've been with the city for about about four-ish years. I was a graveyard shift patrol sergeant in the admin sergeant position. I grew up on the east side, and I wanted to be a ballerina when I grew up. And somehow I wound up in this job. I went to the <laughs> University of I graduated from Bellevue High in '89, and went to the University of Washington, and and I have been in this career for the past 26 years and I, I love I love what I'm doing in the in the city and have been I I love the engagement that our you know that our community has and uh Stan so thank you for your service my daughter just graduated from college and she's got was commissioned into the Air Force and she will be shipped off in November to Charleston so um, Good. Pretty, pretty exciting. Yeah, and my and my son's going to be a senior in high school, and so all kinds of exciting things going on. And I'm just I'm I'm thankful that you uh, have us <coughs> here tonight, and looking forward to this meeting. Thank you all for being here. Uh, what, Rita? Shall we start with the uh, the core program? Yes, so um, I believe Jamie is going to be um, doing a little PowerPoint um, for the core program. And then I think from there, I think it will just be a great sort of segue into sort of like, you know, commissioners asking questions and then having Sergeant Elias and uh, Officer, um, you know, Martin speak as well. So, yes, yeah, so I think we'll start with Jamie if that works with you, Jamie. Absolutely. OK, bear with me while I share my screen. here and this real quick presenter mode I think yeah I'll be presenting mode. yeah okay and can you see let's see am I no I lost it sorry about that It was up, wasn't it? It was. <laughs> I 
My goodness. I told Mike I was going to be good at this and look what happened. It's so good, don't I? <laughs> Let's see. I'm trying not to let you look see my there, speech. Why? <laughs> Let's see. Yay! <laughs> That's yeah, perfect, yeah. Jamie. If we see it. Yeah. You can see it, but it ha I think it has all of my. Oh, sorry. This one's not showing your notes. It's not. Okay. Well, I'll try it again see what happens. You want your notes for you, right? Not us. Yeah, how's that? It's, yep. Mine's getting there. It's not there yet. Can you see it at all? We can see, yes. your, see your, your front page, yes. Excellent. I'll see if I can scroll through this way then. So again, thank you so much for having me and um, I'm excited to share with you about our Core Connect program, which is your mobile integrated healthcare program. So there's three overarching goals of Core. It's to connect individuals to the most appropriate resources and services to meet their unique needs, to reduce high utilizers and low acuity callers of the 911 system. So Low acuity calls are typically non-emergent in nature. So rashes, headaches, small cuts, things of that nature. And frequent 911 callers are typically categorized as like the frail elderly, falls, homeless, mental illness, things like that. And so the third overarching goal of CORE is to expand our partnerships with health and social services. And so we have a team. Uh, this is the core team. There are many different staffing models for MIH programs. And some agencies partner with nurses, with paramedics, EMTs, social workers, and even social worker students. And we have a unique partnership. We chose to partner with a nonprofit, which many of you know, the Issaquah Food and Clothing Bank. We decided to partner with them because they are so well established within the community and they already have such a great um, reputation. Uh, they have established social services. And so what we decided to do was to contract for a loaned employee and we utilize their social services for our core team. So Rebecca is the social services manager. She's a licensed social worker. And Erica is our care coordinator. She has extensive um, experience in social work. And we're already finding that our clients are overlapping, um, which is pretty cool. So the program is funded through the EMS levy. It's a six year levy that was approved in 2020. Um, and as you can see, there's many, many, uh, actually there's nine, programs, MIH programs within King County that are run by fire departments. So what are we doing? How did we get here? The fire service is continually evolving. So in the 70s, EMS was added to the fire service. In the 80s, HAZMAT was added. 90s, early 2000s, we added technical rescue, water rescue, those types of services. So as we continue to evolve, fire-based EMS re must remain relevant within the communities that we serve. And so having a program like CORE really allows us to move towards meeting those needs in a fiscally responsible manner. And we are trying to facilitate better care in a more efficient way. So it's truly a holistic view while providing the best and most appropriate care for individuals. Mm -hmm. And as I'm learning more about what you do in the health and human services provided by the city of Sammamish, this wraparound care really aligns with the work that you're doing, the city's approach to promoting a healthy community, um, meeting the basic needs and 
Uh, Chair, I'm really, I, I need to dig into that assessment that the city did. Um, I'd be very interested in those outcomes. So I'd love to learn more eventually. So our program progress. Um, as Officer Martin said, COVID ruins everything. So it also ruined the start of this program. We were supposed to launch a year ago and we were really delayed in getting this off the ground because of COVID. So the core program launched in late last year, November, and crews started making um, referrals in just earlier this year in March. And as soon as crews began making referrals, and I'll talk about what the referral process looks like, we immediately saw needs within the community. So the first three months, we really started collecting data and implemented processes and procedures. We implemented a software program um, to lay the foundation of the program. And then, like I said, in March was our biggest milestone as of yet, and we implemented home visits with clients. And so that's when the real work began. The core team is a team, it's a firefighter and a social worker or the care coordinator, and they connect with clients in their home. And so that really allows us to get to know them, their environment and their needs. Um, and then as, as the referrals from the crews when they're out in the field increased, our client's database kind of grew uh, really, really quickly. And so we hired another uh, employee through the Isquad Food and Clothing Bank to help with that workload. So what is a referral? So CORE is a referral based program. And um, when before CORE was implemented, when someone calls 911, the only two options that they have is to be transported to the emergency department or treated and left at home. And so with CORE, when crews are responding to 911 calls, they can now assess if a patient, a family member, um, care providers that are in the home could benefit from additional resources. And then the crews choose one or more of these nine reasons for referrals. And so when the crews are on scene responding to that 911 call, they make the assessment. They simply, in their reporting process, they simply click a referral button. They choose one of the reasons and that it automatically routes to our core team. And then the team, a social worker and a firefighter, follow up with a home visit and connect with that individual. And feel free to interrupt me if I'm going too fast or if you have any questions. <laughs> So just some data points during the first three months of the program back in November of last year, the crews were referring about 4% of EMS calls. So since the beginning of this year, they've made over 400 referrals now to the core team. Uh, we've known that there is a need in the communities that we serve, and this increase in referrals to the 12% in just the first few months of the year truly reflect what the crews are seeing out in the field. And the feedback from the crews has been really positive, knowing that there's another avenue and another resource for patient care. Between 2018 and now, about 31 to 32 percent of our EMS calls potentially could have been handled by a non-emergent response, so could have been handled by the core team. There's lots of room for those referral rates to increase. So this is referrals by community. And as you can see, there is need in every single community that Eastside Fire and Rescue serves. We serve North Bend, Sammamish, Issaquah, two fire districts, which cover the May Valley Carnation area. Um, and this also matches our call volume. Cities are always higher with our call volume. This slide captures the reasons for referrals that we're seeing out in the field, uh, what the firefighters are referring. So the most consistent are falls, mobility, healthcare needs, which is different than EMS emergent needs, um, and um, definitely patients that are cannot self-care or they have overwhelmed caregivers. We are definitely seeing an increase in mental health and substance abuse as well. 
So the previous slide, uh, it had about 400 referrals, and you'll note just from these numbers that those don't match up, those numbers don't match up. So oftentimes individuals have really complex needs and the crews, there's multiple factors working. And so the crews have the ability to pick more than one. Um, sorry, was there a question? Okay. Um, so for example, we're working with a client right now um, who was referred to us from for uh, falls and the client has a disability, but contributing factors um, to her falls that she was the primary caregiver for her grandsons and she was trying tiring herself out trying to keep up with them. She's the primary caregiver because her daughter committed suicide. So we were connecting with her for falls, but now we're providing mental health resources for both her and her grandsons. So I feel like any time we go out to a home visit, it's not always exactly what the firefighter is referring us to. There's a, just a, that those complex needs. It's multiple reasons why they're being referred. So in the city of Sammamish, these are your most common reasons for referrals. They really match kind of the overarching reasons as well, falls, mobilities, mental health, healthcare needs. Um, and right now, I think um, overall, the, the core team, we're managing about 70 clients, uh, many of whom we, we visit on a regular basis. Can I ask a question about the city of Sammamish? Absolutely. Just a couple slides back. D did it say that like 32% of the calls were from Sammamish in that graph? So is that disproportionate? I, I mean, I don't I don't know exactly my demographics on how big Issaquah or North Bend are compared to Sammamish. But um, is the question like in regards to population or? Yeah, yeah. Like is that, is Sammamish seem like high in, in regards to the population? Um, I actually don't know the population. I can get that information and kind of do an assessment, but this seems pretty normal to me. Okay. Yeah. And I will just say, um, Jamie, so I think Issaquah, like we are a lot bigger than Issaquah population wise. Um, I believe like we are like 70 and Issaquah is like at 40 something. Um, but I will confirm that. But yes, thank, thank you. Well, not Thanks, Rita. That Thanks, helps. Rita. I'd be curious too. When you said that you that um, the core team is managing with the clients, uh, what exactly does that mean, and what what role, if any, do the nonprofit agencies play in coordinating the care? Yeah, great commit. Great question, Commissioner. So here's uh, just a uh, success story, I would say, with the program. And this kind of cover touches on some of your questions. So when back in 2019, late 2019, we had a uh, patient be referred to the core team. And in 2021, the patient's health started to decline and the need for social services increased. So this individual called 911 He's considered a high utilizer. He called us over 30 times for lift assist from his wheelchair to his bed, he, like had us come to move him around the apartment, which is not the best use of EMS services. So the crews continue to make referrals and we engaged in um, advocacy on his behalf with APS, full life care, um, his case manager at Lifelong, and we were really trying to get him to an, a, a, either an adult family home or a long-term living facility. Uh, we also, he was food insecure as well, and so we connected him to the Mount Sai Senior Center for uh, food delivery services. Uh, we installed a lockbox. He finally approved that, which was awesome because the crews were crawling through his window to uh, respond to him when he called 911, which was unsafe for everybody. Um, and then we were successful in June. We moved him into a, a long-term assisted living facility, which not only did that get him the, the care that he truly needed, but reduced the 911 calls. Um, so it was a win-win for everybody. Mm -hmm. So, Commissioner, did that answer your question? Yeah, very much so. Thank you. Okay, of course. Um, that's that's my presentation, and I'd be happy to answer any more questions that you may have. Well, I had a question about 
uh, of course, this is newspaper Seattle and all that, but when a police report goes to the house and then in a mental health crisis, what, you know, what's the difference now with a, the firefighter going, when does the, when does the mental health person or who is able to talk the mental health down? <clears throat> I know this is a media thing, but. Uh, Martin, did you want to? <laughs> yeah, no, I'll, I'll jump in real quick. There, there's more than one answer for this. So be careful how far into the weeds I get with one of the answers. First, I want to tell a quick story to link it over, though. I found out about Core Connect a few months ago uh, from firefighters at a call where we had a bedridden person who was um, uh, being <coughs> by her husband, who was a man who was dying of cancer and was not well. He'd been he'd fallen the day before, her, injured himself, was taken to hospital. The next day, firefighters called for us to come, and I was uh, just wasn't far away. I was the officer that went. Uh, and she was refusing to go to hospital and she really needed to go. Uh, she being, being as no one was there to do, she has, she can't leave the bed. So all her bodily functions have to be done by her carer and he was in hospital. So I persuaded her to go that day and, but the firefighters were, they were pretty upset and we chatted afterwards and they said, she needs to be referred to core. And I said, I don't know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so one of my answers later on to your question is sometimes the police officers don't even know that a resource has been created. I actually was looking through my notes today and I'd heard of Jamie. She was referred to by the firefighters, but I'm not sure why we didn't connect on that one. Um, but I found other resources uh, as well. Um, so one, Jamie, awesome, but we don't know you're there. Uh, and, and I think some other officers don't. Um, and and I know I'm straying off your question, Joyce, but I'll just, I'm working my way back there. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of stuff, especially lately in the news about police going to calls that maybe aren't police calls. Mm -hmm. um, we don't know until we get there that doesn't really need a police officer a lot of the time. And we're happy to have a mental health professional take over. And I'll give some other scenarios on that too, though. Um, as for your question, though, who talks them down? Mm -hmm. Um you know what, in my experience, it's always been the police. Uh, despite what you might hear, they're very good at it. Um, I, like, I'm amazed. I learn something every time when a different officer becomes the contact officer. Sometimes the patient picks who they want to talk to. Um, and I've learned from every officer who does it because the really all they have to do is listen and be themselves. And, uh, and they can get a lot of success because somebody... Somebody has a lot to get off their chest, and if you are actively listening, it'll work. Um, they're quite good at it. Um, do we want to like give up that role? It's not that we want to give up that role. Um, I did go to a call in Sammamish, late 20s gentleman with schizoaffective disorder. His paranoia was, was really quite high. He was um, seeing other people in the room at the time. A mental health professional was there and called us because they're not there to fight people. And he was very likely going to fight. And you know, well, why don't we just shut the door and leave? Well, because his grandparents is, live there. So, I'm sorry, his elderly parents, I should say. So we can't, we've got a, a safety and a care issue. And if people get violent, that is that's that is our job. So it's not like we're, we're gonna fight for territory over who's gonna get to do what. We just can't in good conscience walk away when it's unsafe. Um, and, and that's a big thing for us. And so uh, I bumped into a firefighter this week. He was off duty. He was saying, hey, are you guys going to stop coming to our calls? And, and I was like, no, 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 no. That's, <laughs> we're not going to stop coming. But we are going to have to get our heads together and go, let's pause. What do we need here? Yeah. Right? And, some, and sometimes you'll call up and they'll say, I do not want to talk to a police officer. And we will go, okay, who would you like to talk to? Would you talk to a firefighter? Yes. All right. How about we do it out on your front porch and we'll back off and we'll get in our cars and we might even park up the, we'll do something that allows them to do their job. But we, you know, depending on what, how we read the room, we'd stay nearby. But we're extremely adaptive and so are the firefighters. So 
Um, I don't know I've answered your question because it's the great catch all is it depends. Yeah. I'm just going to talk them down. It depends. Sometimes I could have a negotiator 10 feet from me hiding behind a tree saying, keep going because I'm the one that they've decided they want to talk to that day. And if I go, oh, there's a professional negotiator here, they're like, oh, you don't want to talk to me? Now I'm upset again, you've broken the connection. So it could be a rookie officer, it could be a veteran, male, female, any, whatever that person decides they're, they're connecting with, then we stay with it. And if they talk to a firefighter and they really fix on a firefighter, then guess what? They are the lead on that and everyone's going to just facilitate that firefighter making the connection or a social worker. Um, massive answer to your question. So I'll try not to do it. Oh, Friends said a lot too. <laughs> so yeah. not, they're not they're not Seattle either. So. You mentioned the rookie officer. Mm -hmm. I, I'm I'm curious to know how much training does that rookie officer get in these kinds of, to deal with these kinds of situations? So I can speak to that. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we. We are required to go to a 40 hour crisis intervention, crisis intervention um, training, which I've been through. And it is, it is very well done and kind of very eye opening really um, to, to kind of give you an insight into uh, mental health issues and maybe best ways to approach. And we also have bias awareness training that builds on that. We have a yearly, you know, two-hour recertification in crisis intervention, um, and really, I think our our overall focus is we want to go home safely. We we want everyone we're dealing with to be safe, and we want the officers to go home safe. So, you know, however, if we need to reach out to our crisis intervention team to come out, or uh, and they're amazing amazing group of people or you know some mobile crisis team or we're working with the you know designated crisis responders in terms of some of these mental health orders that we're um having to serve now and i i literally i just found out about this core program two weeks ago a, a detail came up and said it was for referral from an east side fire social worker and i'm like an east side fire social worker what you know what is this and I looked at it and I looked at the detail and they wanted us there to help make the scene safe because they were kind of concerned that maybe there was a domestic violence and they were a little worried that maybe the perpetrator might be there or show up and wanted us to be there with them so they could effectively help this person get resources and referrals, whatever they needed. And so I thought, wow, this is really cool. And then it just so happened that Rita and I talked and she said, oh, we're having this meeting and we're gonna learn about this. And so I'm really thankful for this program because we don't necessarily know of all the resources in our area. You think we would, but um, it's always, it's it's nice to be engaged and especially with Eastside Fire, because we work, you know, we work well with them and, you know, if there's calls that maybe, and I guess my question for, for, for Jamie would be, how do we make referrals to you? Because there's calls we go on that Eastside Fire doesn't go on. And now we have a place to maybe refer people. And what's the best way to go about doing that? Yeah, that's such a good question. Uh, I think we should definitely have a meeting to talk about how we can support one another. I would love that. Um, right now, the program is referral based from firefighters out in the field when they're responding to a 911 call. But I love the idea and creating a process for police to be able to make referrals as well. And, um, you know, I take full responsibility for the lack of communication with our partners and police. And we just started meeting with Issaquah police and they have a new program as well with their mental health. They have a behavioral health program that they're just starting to implement. And so we're we're just meeting. I think it was just such an infancy program. Um, and we just started doing home visits, trying to roll that out in a successful way. We haven't um, we haven't advertised um, very well um, so we could kind of get our foot feet under us. But you know, now I see we were remiss in that and kind of missed that connection. So um, I look forward to partnering with with you guys 
more. And can I just say we're convening a meeting in August, um, so I know Jamie sent me dates, so I definitely will connect Sergeant Elias and myself and Jamie so we can all, uh, um, you know, sync together for sure. So Jamie, you said that the example that you shared was of a high utilizer. Um, what is the typical utilization rate? If you think about your overall, like, you know, the, the people who reach out. Yeah, that's a really good, great question. And I think we're still collecting data on that because we've really only, you know, eight months worth of, of data, we're still collecting that. So I would love the opportunity to run some reports and get that information back to you. But our crews often see the same people over and over again, and may, maybe not 30 times, but definitely three to 10 times we're seeing uh, the same people. Yeah. Y'all yeah, might add to answer from out and real quickly. Um, we have high utilizers. We all know them. Uh, if I say their name, other Sammamish officers were like, oh yeah, when did you last speak to so-and-so? Yeah. And when I was invited to this today, uh, I read what you guys do and, and, and I was like, gee, if only there was an entity that police could refer these people to who could case manage them, Jamie. And um, and I thought, if I get to free, if, if they said, Matt, what would you wish for? I'd go, can I please have a Jamie right, <laughs> that I can refer stuff to? And and there's only, off the top of my head, in my in the sort of a little over a year I've worked at Sammamish, there's about 10 people that if I referred them, we would, our call volume would drop. Um, mm -hmm. Some of them are regular and some of them are cyclic, cyclic meaning yeah. they'll call us six times in three days. Each will require a visit from an officer and then we won't hear them, them from for months. Uh, yes. And then there's others that are weekly callers that they they their crisis hits once a week and we go and speak to them. There's no real police work. We're just listening to them. Um, and and on rare cases, maybe they take a trip to hospital, but sometimes they just want to do that. And that is the job. If we had someone we could refer them to, they might be calling 911. Because I've got one, she also asks for an interpreter every time. And the interpreters rotate, so they don't know her. She tells them these horrible stories, and then that comes through to us. And then we see the name, and we're like, OK, we're good. We know how to, what to do. Um, so the only note I wrote during your presentation, Jamie, was how to refer. And Sergeant Elias already asked yeah. that. Well, uh, so we will make that happen. No, I bring it on. Like, let's make it happen. I'm excited about this. And I'm actually really curious if we have clients that already overlap with some of the individuals that you're seeing yep. in the short amount of time. Like, really, we've been like communicating with Issaquah PD in a matter of weeks, and we've already seen an overlap in somebody that they're seeing mm -hmm. and someone we're seeing. Um, so. I'm excited about that. Yes, I'm happy to be your Jamie for the referrals. <laughs> but the high utilizers suggest that there's lack of awareness about the services in the community. And that's why once people find someone, they just constantly reach out to them. So it may be because of lack of awareness, I feel. Absolutely. Yeah. And and a, perhaps a lack of one wanting help, oftentimes with you know, we'll see. I, I predict because I talk to other MIH providers, they have clients for years that, you know, really gaining that trust and building the relationship and connecting them or hoping to connect them with resources. Um, sometimes that takes two or three home visits. And, you know, we've had a client since day one that is really uh, resistant to services that were just really anytime. You know, and that's part of the high utilizer is that we can go out and they'll reject our services, which is fine. It's a voluntary program. But when 911 is called again, we'll go out again and we will sit, provide the same resources and the same services. And they'll say no. And 911 is called again. And so it kind of gives us ammunition to really say, all right, we're building our case. You really need other services besides 911. We're here to help you. So sometimes it takes a little while. I'd like to move to domestic violence. 
because we believe it's underreported, or at least we believe it is, and we don't know about no. the social Joyce, taboo. Joyce, Dan has a question, Joyce. Oh, yeah. Okay, Stan. Well, before we move on to this, and it's very important, um, is it possible to get law enforcement and East Side Fire and Rescue uh, informed of what nonprofits that we help fund and what's available in the city of Sammamish so that they will have a little bit better of a referral system? I don't know if it's existed in the past that we've done it or not. Can we can we facilitate that? Well, that's a absolutely. I mean, that's a yes. Um, it's already started. Well, this meeting, for for example, um, you won't have any trouble selling uh, core to the Sammamish police officers. Um, but that happens everywhere. I, when we go to uh, say a person has passed away, there's a job the police do. Uh, but there's we get a chaplain to come and that's because the chaplain can sit down and explain to the family um, multiple different cultures, multiple different expectations as to what's going to happen. And they can do that. Um, this is no different to that. Uh, police officers are super relieved when a chaplain shows up. They'll be just as relieved when a core representative shows up who can can who is focused on that on those problems. So um, it won't take long for us to. Once we sit, get our heads together, uh, it'll take off in some damage. There's no doubt. If I can chime in for a minute too, we, as law enforcement, we are such short term. So we come in during the, the, the crisis, but then we are called to another crisis or a crime here or whatever we need to be doing. And so to have something more long term set in place is so beneficial to people that we signed up to help and but we we're only this piece of the puzzle and we need a bigger piece of the puzzle and i think the communication i think this is great with this meeting because we're starting this communication and i think the ongoing partnership is really really important between all of us sergeant i love that you said yeah. that because it's the same for firefighters we're in there for 15 20 minutes for an emergency and then we're out and we're only doing one or two things <laughs> So, um, yeah, I love that you said that, and I'm excited to partner. And Can I, I appreciate that. Off. And I, I kind of feel like the more tools that the city may be able to offer you will benefit the community as a whole. Uh, for example, you were talking about sending in a chaplain. Um, you know, I'm, I work with veterans and veteran administration. And, and if you run into a veteran who's passed away, uh, that chaplain needs to know what's available to offer to the family from the VA standpoint. You know, that's just uh, something that we do. Um, so if we can add anything and help you with your toolbox, let us know. And this is a good start. And along those same lines, I was going to ask, um, Jamie, you mentioned expanding partnerships was one of the things you want to do. If, like, what um, areas would you expand into, or or who would you look to partner with? Well, like like Commissioner said, local nonprofits, um, our social workers, and our care coordinator, they're the one. They're the boots on the ground, so they really connect with local resources and state resources, like the veterans program. Um, but really knowing what's out there and connecting with Rita to hear about all the services that the city provides, City of Issaquah, City of North Bend, um, and everywhere in between. Um, we're building those relationships with other MIH programs. We, we meet on a monthly basis regionally to talk about local resources that are shared resources, nonprofits. Um, so those are the type of partnerships that we're looking to expand, as well as with, you know, all the uh, assisted living facilities, uh, adult family homes. There's a unique uh, community within those uh, that we respond to often. Uh, so building those relationships as well is really important to us. So, yeah, so great question. Jamie, Thank you. Is there law enforcement involved in any of those meetings or? Um, N none that I can think of. No, like the regional meetings, the MIH meetings. Yeah. No. Ah, okay. 
I, mean, I just think from a communication standpoint, not that anybody would come in and try and tell you what to do, but just so we have all, you know, as much information as possible. I don't, I, I don't know if a thing, but you know, my dad is a very frequent um, user of EMS services and my, you know, my sister's a nurse. So, you know, thankfully she's been really amazing in trying to help navigate the system, but it, the system is so vast and confusing and discombobulated and non-user friendly that, yes. you know, I think trying to you know, make sure everybody knows everything is, I guess, communication. I'm just going to go back to that. I think it's just super, yeah. super important. I love it. I th that's a wonderful idea. And I can definitely get us connected with the right groups of people when it comes to the MIH, the regional aspect of it. I, I don't see any harm in having police there to really build that bridge. And like you were saying um, with your family, this is what we see often is overwhelmed caregivers that don't know how to navigate the healthcare system. Um, we see that often. So we are real advocates and we hold their hand through that process. It's not necessarily only the patient that is being referred, but also the, the support system, the, you know, the daughters that are, you know, taking care of their parents. Um, it, we see it often. So Which is fantastic. It's, it's, it's fantastic. I, I think this is a, such a wonderful concept and, you know, other is not of a, a mental state to really be fully engaged. I mean, he needs he needs support because it's confusing to everybody. But you know, just as advanced age, and I mean, just to be able to, I mean, have this program for people who maybe also don't have family support or don't have someone who has the knowledge to figure out where to go or what to do. I think this is. I think this is Domestic violence, is it underreported? Do you think there's a social taboo about it? What is your experience in our community? Anybody? This, all right, so I, I <laughs> to break the silence, uh, I had this conversation today. There was an incident extremely recently in Sammamish um, and with a pattern going on where officers, one officer I spoke to has been to this residence more than once. Um, the, there is domestic violence uh, sporadically in the home. Police have been to the home, but the victim refuses to work with the justice system. Um, so it's really hard for us to do something. Now, the pressures are that there is um, some cultural issues where the the wife is from she is the uh, she's the stay-at-home mom he is the high income earner at a local company so she has quite to the off one of the officers face said i you know i can't afford to get out of this um now he told or he this is a group he disagrees that there are robust legal um mechanisms in place but she disagrees with him. It's um, and there's only so much an officer can do before it's like, I really can't be in your home any longer. Like I've, you know, I've done the police part. If only I could refer you to a service that could visit occasionally and tell you there are other white other options. I didn't answer your question, Joyce, on is it underreported in the sense we don't know how often it's underreported, but we do know it's we know it's happened and we've been left unable to do something about it. So it's been reported by someone like our neighbor, but the victim has to, there's a certain amount of cooperation they have to give us. And we know why they're not giving it. We know it's not, they're not just being obstructive. They're, it, from their point of view, it, it is not in their interest. Um, and so, but that problem isn't a Sammamish problem. That's an everywhere problem. But it does mean in Sammamish, if there's other resources we can refer, too great uh, because the police constantly coming back would be unlikely to be healthy for that. Um, like preemptively coming back, say, hey, you want to think about another statement for us or something? It's not, it's not going to work. But at least 
if victims could be more educated on their legal options because I because their abuser is convincing them of their lack of options, um, they need to have other voices in their life. Um, and so, yeah, I kind of answered your problem. The answer is yes. How much? Mm -hmm. I don't know. But it still comes down to what can we do? We can we we send James people over. So you know we have a large immigrant community, and you know if you are in a different country, you don't really understand the legal options you have. You are really concerned about going to the authorities. I mean, like I, I think it would be helpful to think about options for working on these issues with immigrant communities where there are many other issues involved besides you know some of the issues that domestic residents might face right because there's this concern about going to the authorities not being in a foreign land not really knowing any of the laws and rules and regulations so it's just it creates like an added set of challenges Elias, I see your hand up. I did. Let me have, so I can speak to this a little bit. We put on pre pre COVID, um, and to try to do some things online meetings as well. But we were invited by one of the community organizations to do what they titled was is it, it was an immigrant safety forum, and it wasn't just about it, it. was kind of like building partnerships with the police. They don't they don't know us. We don't know people, and trying to get engaged. And we've had you know they'd ask questions about car seats and you know safety in general and we talk about violence and how we can help and who we are and and so I think I, I don't know I, I'm just tossing this out but I think you know we're willing to be engaged with our community in whatever way they need us to, to be and so if we can get involved in more forums such as that. And maybe that'll be a discussion where we can have offline to figure out maybe there's an idea where Sammamish PD can can start answering some of these questions and, and building trust with 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 people in our community that are new to our community or that maybe have been in the community but are, you know. I think partnering with some organizations, community organizations like IAWW or the Chinese Information Center, like, I mean, that could be an option that are closer to those immigrant communities yep. and have it made inroads in those communities. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, we, we're a partner with the community and whatever, you know, whatever we can do to, in whatever way people want us to be engaged, we would really love to work together and, and do those types of things. So um, another organization that's not only on the east side, they're, they're based in Seattle, but API Chaya, have you heard of them? Yeah. They're, yeah. They're, so they specialize in domestic violence for immigrant women and they have advocates uh, who work with uh, women in these situations. Um, I think that would be a good one to reach out to in terms of there may even have they may even have some basic information that's translated of resources that you can give out. I'm not sure. I'm wondering if sorry, I haven't introduced myself. I was sorry, I apologize for being late. I'm Jody Nishioka, I'm one of the commissioners. Um I'm also wondering, have you guys worked with or explored in the past a victim the victim advocate? um model I mean, that's, happened, that's happened in the communities and i don't know if you guys have that capability or have explored that or we have a in terms of be having one specifically assigned to a police department or just in general or just i mean you know specifically around dv having so, being able to call on when you have a dv call being able to call a person who's trained to work with the victim about like you were saying um to um you know be that other voice where they're they're only hearing what their abusers telling you not that they're only but oftentimes abusers isolating them so they're not being able to hear and right. often, you know, when you say oh they we want them to hear other voices other than their abusers, oftentimes isolation is a key 
a key tool that abusers use. So they're not able to. They, you know, they monitor where their phone is, where they're lo- where they're traveling to. They monitor their the mileage on the car. They monitor the money that they have, so they can't even go shopping. Um, you know, they do. There, there's all these tactics that that these abusers do. So they don't always have the ability. They monitor their um, internet yep. traffic, who they're, where they're looking up stuff. So they they can't always get those voices. So when they, by the time they're calling you and it's a desperate situation, they need that other voice. So I'm just uh, one model that's out in the community that's been a best practice for many years, but not all many places don't have the funding for it. But having a trained advocate who could, who's not an officer, but who has training in what are all the resources and how to work with a victim, um, a, 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 actually a survivor to like understand what the dynamics are and how to relate to them and how to give them the information so that, you know, pull them aside away from the abuser to have that conversation. So just wondering if you've heard of that, if you've heard of that, that's... Well, we do have a domestic violence advocate that works with the prosecutor's office, mm-hmm. but I would say we've referred, we've referred victims to her that maybe there was a case through the system and say, hey, can you maybe help us out here? They help you out? In, in an ideal world, I'd like to have someone who's 24 seven. Right. They're Monday through Friday, and th- these things don't happen, you know, Monday through Friday, 8 to 4, during, you know, court hours. So that presents a little bit of a challenge. Um, but, yeah, I mean, we do work with the domestic violence advocates. And when I was in our special assault unit, um, you know, for sexual assault victims and and all of that, I mean, we had, there was a, there's a dedicated team through the King County Sexual Assault Resource Center that we worked very closely with. Right. Um, we just need more people, <laughs> you know. Of course, there's also um, Hope um, LifeWire and on the east side. I'm sure you guys are connected with them. Yes. Yes. Definitely. Well, we can move um, the subject towards the. The incidents of hate crime, have you seen it in our community? And what can we do? What is being done? So we have not seen the numbers. I, I, I watch the news and, and see things reported. We are, we're really not seeing it in Sammamish. We've had a few incidents where people have um, maybe said something that was very inappropriate. Um, but that in itself is not a crime. So we we just aren't seeing the, those types of crimes happening in our city right now. And I really hope it continues that way. Um, we're, like I said, we're just not seeing it. And is that because it's not being reported? I don't know. I mean, we have the same issue with domestic violence. I, I don't know. You know, could it be happening? Of course, but but what we are seeing in terms of what's being reported to us are it's just not um, not occurring. Yeah. Kristen, I think um, maybe a year ago um, or maybe just before the pandemic, and Rita might remember this. Like some people had um, written like something, you know, had um, spray painted really foul language. On people's garages, and, um, and I don't know whether something like that constitutes a crime at all, or it's it has to be something physical. It, it does, but it it's we have to show that it's targeted against a certain a certain community, and so some of the you know if I'm, I'm remembering this case correctly, but if some of the you know graffiti while completely inappropriate um, is not does not fit the culture that they're targeting or the race that they're targeting you know it's a, there's there's a lot of dynamics that go in go into that and but I tell you <laughs> anything that comes in that is even remotely 
maybe a hate crime. We are gonna we drop everything and we we work on it because we will not tolerate that in our city. Homelessness. Do you have any experience with homelessness in the city? What are you seeing or hearing or what are you not hearing? I've never seen a homeless rate so low. Uh, like, I think I personally know one homeless guy by name um, who moves around some and he comes and goes a little. Actually, there's two because uh, I re-met one recently. Um, and these are guys who don't, they, they refuse services. Um, and they just kind of they have that existence um they're not they're not really someone who to bring into this meeting i go wow we really need to work on a and a homeless problem it's not something that sammamish police officers tend to when we're sitting around going what things will we wish we could fix it's not something that comes on our radar uh sarge you might know see more come across your desk and add to that No, but I will say, you know, I, I'm thinking of some a couple specific examples and services are refused every time we offer them. But again, like Jamie has said before, you got to keep, we got to keep offering them. We got to maybe, we got to bring in the, you know, maybe a different resource or a different perspective. Maybe at some point they will accept services. I mean, we can't give up on them, obviously. And, and, uh, but I wouldn't say that we have a huge population of homeless um, people in the city. I think there's, you know, could that change? Could change in a minute. I mean, we're revolving every day, but I think where what, we're at now. Yeah. What, what about amongst the youth? Do you see any indications of youth who are couch surfing? They've got problems at home, um, so they're just moving from, you know, from one friend to another friend to another friend. It's occasionally the school has mentioned it um, happening in the past. They have a very robust system to get resources to children who are having that issue. Uh, so it hasn't really ever become, sorry, I won't say it hasn't become a police issue. It hasn't been one for me and I work at the school. Um, it's there's already a robust program, but even then it's apparently quite rare. Jamie? So, yeah. So I talked to um, our social worker who is the um, outreach manager also at the Issaquah Food and Clothing Bank to to hopefully provide insight on this question. And she did say that there is homelessness in Sammamish, but not as uh, quite as much as Issaquah. Um, she did say there's homelessness that people can't see. And that's similar to what Commissioner Hall was speaking of, um, that even if you aren't seeing it, homeless encampments, people on the corner, it's happening in families that are potentially doubled up in homes, in cars, um, or possibly at risk of home, like homelessness uh, due to high housing costs. So that was her input that I just wanted to pass along to you. Crimes of desperation when people are stealing hygiene items or food or, or things. We know that you know, from what we read that Safeway doesn't go after somebody who's taken something. But are we having that as a problem at all in the city? Uh, and, and Sergeant Elias, unless you disagree, I'd say no. It's I, it almost, I've never been to a shoplifting in Sammamish that was basic human needs based. I would say the majority of the sho shoplifting are from, People in crisis, and also people who 
are being paid to go steal items of value that they can go sell for high dollars for other people. So I would say those those two things are probably the majority of what we see in terms of shoplifting. Or we were having a big problem a couple a year or so ago with juveniles coming in stealing alcohol and tried to work with the stores to lock up their booze and and and, and all of that. But I would say those two things are probably the most of what we're seeing now. And the organized retail theft that Sarge mentioned is regional. It's not a Sammamish thing. They they move from city to city and store to store. Uh, so not to have to, you know, so we aren't prepared for them. And they're very well organized. <laughs> I will tell you that. But, you know, we do get them, but they it is a regional thing and they're a well organized group of people. Which kind of items, if you don't mind me asking, are they, do they go for to resell? Well, if it's small and has value, so the concentration of the value of the item, um, the most recent one I, that comes to mind is the portable telephone chargers. They're small battery systems, but if you grab 30 of them, you've, you know, you've got a small fortune that you can fit in a small bag. Um, so it can be anything. Uh, makeup products are small, but concentrated in, in in price to size value, if you like, uh, and can be easily resold. So um, that's kind of the theme. You could fit ten thousand dollars in a shopping cart if you concentrate on keeping it small and high in value. Baby formula was a big thing for a while too, and also we, someone we they they we arrested. It's been a, a minute, but. They were stealing. They they literally had a list from someone said, "I want you to take." And they had bags of frozen prawns. I don't know. I don't know why, but they were. They had this list of things that they were told. This is what you need to steal, and we're going to sell it. So it just kind of varies. It, it varies. A question for our school resource officer. What is it that you do? What is everything. the role? I do everything. Being a nice guy. <laughs> uh, look, I hope my best priority, the top thing I can do is connect with kids. Um, there's 2,000 of them at the school. I only got 55% of them back at the end of the school year for seven weeks. So I regard myself as very much a rookie uh, at that role. Um, but even in that short time, it was great to make the connections I made. Um, kids are really curious about police officers, like elementary school kids just think we're all heroes. So I'm, you, you, I'll easily visit the local elementary school, high school, much more conflicted. Okay. They've got, um, different media views of us. Um, and, and so, but they're interested in hearing what I have to say. Uh, I tell them they can ask me anything, uh, and create those forums for them. Uh, and I just can't wait to get back to school to do that. <coughs> also, they can report crime to me. Um, and I also try to keep tabs. I tell Sammamish police officers if they contact kids, try and ask them what high school they go to and send me a note. I might follow that kid up much like I would, you know, especially if they've been in a violent incident or they're a victim of crime in some way, balancing their privacy, you know, offering just letting them know if they want to talk to someone. Uh, some take me up on it um, and some don't, uh, but over time I grow on them and uh, they, you know, they get comfortable with me. Um, there are more organic things you're always doing. So school safety is my thing. Uh, different to every other person on the school, I'm always wandering around with a little radar on for something that could threaten the student population. Um, so and you've got to be, it's not like out in public where police tend to stand off. You've got to let the kids get close to you. Um, that Their body space, their private spaces are, tend to be smaller. Uh, and so if you stand off them, you won't connect with them. So you, it's different to to normal policing. But uh, geez, it's a lot of fun. It's really stimulating. It's really easy to go to work when there's kind of school. Uh, I, I kind of can't think what else I can add to that. But if you have a more specific question, I'll... I'll, hit, I'll, I'll answer it. Drinking and drug use. Ooh, so 
uh, COVID ruins everything. I don't know uh, in the sense I know kids drink. Um, I'm never I'm never really hearing about those horror stories of uh, where kids are just to toxic to the point of being taken to hospital. It happens, but it's it, it's not something recently where we've gone. Wow, we really need to tackle this problem. Um, we do try to hold people accountable, make sure parents are aware, okay. um, that kind of thing. Uh, they don't just get to walk away. And this, the school, if it's school related, uh, I've been pretty impressed. The schools uh, have a very robust program of engaging the family, um, holding the children accountable, offering them resources. Uh, they, can, they get drug and alcohol counseling and this kind of stuff and all this stuff. And it's all mandatory, but it's done in a way that I don't think the kids tend to resent it. Um, so I haven't had to dip into that or go, gee, Sammamish PD needs to respond to this problem because the schools have really been very good at it. And we partner with some of the schools in the area, Sammamish and in Issaquah. We have a hidden in plain sight. Uh, Officer Martin, have you been involved oh. in that with ours um, nope. or Sergeant? Um, and uh, I can definitely get more information on it, but that's a, um, we set up a, what looks like a room, like a teenager's room, and we hide drugs um, in plain sight, and we have parents come and kind of walk through and see if they can find them, and so it's just that drug awareness, but we also do a DUI drills with our students um, and partner with the schools on that, and we uh, bring in cars and we moulage kids and put makeup on them and um, talk about, you know, those real life scenarios. So um, just maybe another opportunity for us to partner together. Yeah. Yeah, I've been at the the Hidden Plain Sight events before at, at CWU and in Sammamish, and it is a real eye opener for parents. And the constant comments that I kept hearing was, I had no idea this could be drug paraphernalia or this could be something or this could be a sign that my child is needs help and I mean the the awareness piece is is key with with that I have a question not about youth so much but just about the opioid issue i mean it, it we haven't heard that much about it in recent in the last year during covid but previous to that it seemed to be a big issue particularly in white communities which we which we are so wondering if you have any information about that i don't have a good answer for you there because it's simply it's so sporadic um that i couldn't identify a trend myself uh and this and with the covid we lost connection with a lot of the kids for the last year. Um, and the ones who opted to return to school aren't the kids who need us the most in a lot of cases. So I, I, I can't give you a definite, a good, a cl good, clear answer. And for, we do see quite a, substance abuse is um, one of the growing uh, reasons for referrals that we're seeing. Part of it is from COVID. We saw mental health and substance abuse referrals increase. That's countywide. Um, all the MIH programs saw that increase, um, especially in the third quarter of 2020. Uh, I'd be happy to try to pull some data for the city in regards to what we're seeing for substance, um, refer substance abuse referrals. Um, we do respond to home visits quite a bit when that's involved. That would be great for us to know. You know, I had a question about, did you experience any changes to the types of calls you were receiving during or due to COVID? I think we've got an answer there, don't we? Anything you want to add more to that? i would never seen as many teenagers in what I might call mid to high level crisis than any other time as a police officer. I've never seen it. It was horrible. Um, if you ever wanted to ask my opinion, should kids be back in school, I would have said yes many, many months ago because uh, I was inside their homes watching them fall apart. And this wasn't kids who were somewhat destined to suffer crisis because of the environment they were in at home. Um, this was uh, one example, an athlete 
someone destined to be a Division One runner. Uh, she has lives a structured life of training and competing and school and family. And they took away training and competing, and she could not cope with that. Uh, she's clearly highly focused on her sport and where it's taking her in her life. And uh, and suddenly that was ripped out. And what's the answer for that? Um, and so she went into crisis. And some of those kids, what really uh, was hard to take away is it it, it damages their, their fundamental confidence of their future success, right? Um, and then it actually makes them underperform coming out of it because they're like, oh, I'll never be that good again, that kind of thing. It shakes that confidence. And um, uh, it was a damaging year from that point of view um, that there was just so much more of it. And um, I, when you would bring it up with other police officers, we were all seeing it, yet we, the story didn't seem to get out. It seemed to be, no, no, it's, it's, it's not a problem. And uh, that was kind of frustrating. Uh, I, I mean, it's kind of behind us now. I, I, I'm, I don't want to whine about it, but it, that's, the question was asked. You know, yes, the teenagers really struggled um, just having their lives changed. And the other addition to that was, I don't think any of us would have said a year ago, hey, wouldn't it be cool if all our kids only reacted uh, interacted with each other via social media wouldn't that be healthy like no one would say that yet that's where we shoved them all for an entire year and uh so if i went back in time i'm like oh man i, I this is not going to be good um yeah i, I don't know if but, uh, dwelling on it's not gonna, uh, acknowledging it's important especially that if we get another pandemic that we're going to have to come up with some way to get children out of their homes the other thing i saw and i started calling it compression I was in homes, this is early in the pandemic, families that were healthy families, but were crumbling because they were just together too much. They needed to just get out. And I said, and this was, there was a rural family or you know, they're out sort of uh, like full city, that kind of area. And I said, go for a walk in the park. We're not allowed to walk in the park. I said, you know what? No deputy is going to stop you walking into a park for your mental health with your family. Because that's where we were. I was just like, if you don't get out of the home, we're going to be back here dealing with with self harm because that's where one of the children was was headed, and uh, and she was her whole life had switched to social media, which for her was grossly unhealthy. And uh, all right, now I've gone. I think I've, I think I've, I think I've sold my answer. I'll stop there. <laughs> we had members of the uh, Spanish Youth Board in, in a panel with us a couple of months ago, and they spoke to the isolation and the factors and what they missed and. It was really hard to hear. Yeah. I mean, we oldsters have a, had problems, but those kids have, you know, 70 years ahead. Yeah. Wow. And we also saw the same isolation issues with elderly who were confined to their homes, yes. uh, couldn't get out, uh, people couldn't come visit them. Uh, so similar uh, to what Officer Martin was speaking to is we saw that increase um, depression, anxiety uh, among the elderly as well. Yeah, I had that really affected a lot of people. I experienced that with both of my parents and my mom wound up passing away just after Thanksgiving. And I really think the isolation for her was a big part, a huge piece of it because uh, she was a very social person and and you know, human interaction is a basic need. And we have, you know, our police youth explorers who are an amazing bunch of, of young adults and watching them. And we tried to adapt our program. So we did our online meetings, but it, it just, it, it wasn't the same. And, and so, you know, even when Smamish, the city came back and said, we're doing all, you know, here's the events we're gonna have. They signed up for all of them because they want to get they want to be engaged and they want to be around each other and around people. So seniors who fall in their homes, what can we do or how can we help them prevent this education or home modifications or yeah, there's so much that we can do. There's so many resources for seniors. Um, and we see that quite often. I Almost the majority of our calls are falls. Um, it's a really high referral rate. 
Uh, we work really closely with King County fall prevention. They like we have them on speed dial. Uh, and if they aren't able to get out to the home, you know, in a timely manner, they can eat, we have an iPad, we can do a FaceTime with them and they can walk around the homes with us. We offer to um, install, you know, grab bars, uh, rearrange furniture, take away, you know, educate on, you know, oh, maybe that mat right there that you love is that rug isn't the best thing for you because it's a tripping hazard um, where they're so they're so used to those comforts in in their home and that it's difficult to kind of rearrange furniture and whatnot they're they're attached to that so it takes some time um, but we have lots of education materials and uh, we are happy to take on any referral for a falls other questions from our our commission I've got a couple of things. They're not really questions um, on a personal side. So, Jamie, all of those things in the windowsill, are those challenge coins? Yes, sir, they are. Okay. And <laughs> was your, what branch was your dad in? He was in the Coast Guard. Oh, shallow water Navy. I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've heard that before. Very good. Very good. <laughs> um, and the other thing, Christine, or uh, yeah, Christy, thanks for your daughter joining up. Um, I retired from the Air Force. I spent most of my career in the what was called the Office of Special Investigations. Oh. And, and if she has an opportunity to get involved or get with them, it will be a great career move for her if she decides to make it a career. I hope she I really I really hope she does. My dad was in the Air Force as well and still tells has many, many, many wonderful stories. And she her first assignment going in is gonna be uh aircraft maintenance. And I gotta tell you, pinning on her little butter bars was was a very, very extremely proud moment for me. And I'm so thankful for her serve, you know, wanting to serve our so, country and for anyone who does. Uh, especially now and you know so you're familiar with the air force so you're familiar with the osi and so you know i got a little bit of background in that area so when you guys start talking about law enforcement i kind of reminisce <laughs> but i want to thank you guys for being here tonight and matt travel halfway around the world for us so <laughs> welcome Thank you. Do you want to uh, tell us anything that we forgot to ask you or should have told asked you? Uh, there was there's one thing, something that's just cooking in my brain a little. Uh, it might be something that someone else in the room can take my idea and explain it better later. But I'll be real. I'll try and be really short because I can I can talk a little too much. I grew up in a very small country town. It was not culturally diverse. There were basically Catholics and Protestants, and then a small percentage of what we called other. Um, but if a family was in crisis of some kind, income maybe their house has fallen into squalor or their roof has a leak, a police officer could mention it to their relevant priest, and people would show up and do something. I tried that idea in Sammamish on a single incident. I bet that's going to be one of Jamie's clients. Um, it was uh, the bedridden female and her husband who was dying of cancer, and, and it was just they were not surviving. I noticed, based on the furniture in the house, that they were Jewish. So relying on my old instincts, I contacted a local rabbi, and I got the rabbi's wife. And she was actually familiar with them but hadn't contacted them for two years, and I got them to re re ignite some sort of contact. Just can you reach out to them? Right now, I was no one was skirting on the edges of service and, pri and privacy. Um, but it reminded me that there's a lot of different cultural groups in just Sammamish that could help families out um, as another resource. People are, are dying for a good cause to volunteer for, like they'll do it. And sometimes it requires some kind of cultural match because the government coming to help you. It's a little invasive for some people, whereas if it's kind of your people in some way, they can come 
kind of sell the concept to you and say, could you just let us in your house and we can do some laundry? You know, it won't work with everyone. I don't know if it's doable because I just I don't feel like I've been here long enough to read the room of Sammamish in the state of Washington. But I meet a lot of good people who want to do stuff, but they just don't have that that thing. I don't you know what I mean? So if someone who knows Sammamish better than me or knows the community better thinks that maybe that maybe those people already exist as a, as a formed group. Uh, I've been as a veteran involved in Team Rubicon and they they're all ex or veterans who show up at disasters all over the US and in other parts of the world just because they're done with their service but they want to they want to help someone out. I'd love to have that kind of thing for a local community. Uh, and the police would kind of be able to say, oh, I'm just going to let Jamie know or this other person know. If they get somewhere with it, great. If they don't, well, I know I'll be going back to this house again because it is slowly imploding on itself. Um, if that's something that you guys go off and turn into something, sign me up as your first volunteer. Um, uh, I don't know. And I don't know if I'm talking, if I'm dumping an idea on you either. So if I am, you can toss it back to me and I'll help out. That's all I wanted to add. Uh, that's thing been stewing in my mind. I just haven't been able to sit in the same room with the people I think could make it happen. Thank you. Well, once upon a time, about 10 years ago, we had a Sammamish Cares program that Eastside Friends of Seniors was running. And people could call and ask for help, whether it was trip hazards in their back deck or uh, lawn care or something like that. And there were minimal calls. And I think it was just because the visibility wasn't there. And I don't know. I think the program died of because it wasn't being utilized. Right, right. So it'd be interesting to see. Or well, to I've, been, I've been in a home that you know, the husband had a job, the wife was a stay at home, but the home was overwhelmed and they just couldn't catch up. And mm -hmm. I was like, God, if I could just get, you know, when I was a kid, it'd be my dad because he's that guy. He'll come with you, kick your door in and fix everything and leave. And because uh, he was kind of forceful that way, but people accepted it because he kind of wouldn't let him not accept it, his charity. Um, and, but there was merit to it. Uh, and I feel like that's missing. It's not, I'm not having a religion v government argument here. I'm saying there is there's a resource out there that we're not tapping, and that's just people who want to help out. Not every day, just they get a call. Yeah, sure, I can come and do a few hours with a group of people. I mean, what you're saying, Matt, is not far off at all. I know someone at work who um, whose parents immigrated from Eastern Europe and her, her dad was very skeptical about the government and she could not go to college because he was not willing to get sign some paperwork. Uh, for, for years, she could not go to college because of that. So there is, you know, depending on where you come from, there can be a lot of skepticism about the government yeah. and government yeah. interference. Yeah. I think we also learned about the discomfort of many who don't have the background that police are good people and don't want to approach for uh, help. Do you remember when we had some of our cultural diversity panel members speaking to that? Yeah, and, and that's something we we want to break that down. We, like we'll, we'll, I'll come to any of these uh, for any forum. Uh, and if there's people in there that are that are upset, then they can they can say what's upsetting them, and we'll say, well, let's let's work on it. But you won't any of these forums if it's about trying to engage. You won't have any problem getting a Sammamish officer to show up. So, yeah, absolutely agree, 100 percent. Yeah, well, we greatly appreciate you being with us tonight and being so upfront and honest. And glad we could introduce you to each other to learn each other's resources. I mean, <laughs> that felt good for all of us. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, and I, I hope we continue on with these conversations. And I, I don't know. I will give you all of my cell phone, which is on twenty four hours a day. If you need something or have an idea or some way we can partner, or we need to have a meeting and to discuss or any anything, um, I'm always available. As is, you know, our, our chief is is amazing too, and. We're very fortunate to have him. So I just I want to throw that out there since this is the first time that I've met with you with your commission and, and appreciate the invite for sure. 
So, but I want to make sure you guys know how to contact me so we can continue these conversations and continue the work because I think all of our hearts are in wanting to help people. Yes. Yeah, I would say ditto. I'm, I'm on 24 seven. So Rita has my information. Please share it. I look forward to the partnerships that we're building. Um, and I really look forward to hearing about the resources in Sammamish um, and partnering with, with you for those. Thanks so much for having us. Um, and ditto on our chief. Our chief's pretty great too. So lots of work we can do together to accomplish the same same mission. It's wonderful that we're all aligned, same common goals. Thank you for being with us. Greatly appreciate it. Shall we move on to the next agenda item and let our good people either stay or tune out? Well, just let me add my thanks to you all coming. This has been very enlightening to us. Thank you. Yes. I agree. Thank you very much. Thank you. We just got some updates for us. You're excused. Okay. <laughs> but you can stay if you want to hear. No, you're That's welcome. To, you, you're welcome <laughs> to listen to the mundane and the boring, but <laughs> Commissioner you won't be insulted Horn, if you leave. Commissioner Horn, I resemble that comment. Are you saying when I speak, it's mundane? <laughs> yeah. boring. That, was, that was not intended uh, as anything other than to give them an excuse to get out. Let them go. I, I was We're going standing. to leave, but, but I'm worried that maybe now I should stay. <laughs> it's like an awkward, like, yeah, you know. But the thing is, with the, with, the thing with you being may, online, you can't just casually just, like, leave through the back door, right? It's uh, <laughs> You may not want to see how the sausage is made here. <laughs> <laughs> oh! I am going to leave. Uh, All I right, really thank appreciate you so your much. time. I'll come back thank whenever you, you want. Uh, and I'm going, I've been called to dinner, so good night. <laughs> thank you. And thank you. Thank, you all. thank you all. Since I'm being kicked out, I will. <laughs> I no, will. you're not being kicked out. <laughs> no, I, I appreciate the opportunity to meet with you all. I really do. And and I can't wait to continue. We, we've got to keep moving forward and keep the lines of communication open for sure. So, yes. so thank you all. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sergeant. Rita, you're on. Right. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you. Um, okay, so um, I just wanted to um, update you guys. So, um, you know, as you know, we're part of the um, Eastside Human Services Group, uh, along with our sister cities. And uh, um, all the cities are getting ARPA funding, the American Rescue Plan funding coming in. And rather than all of us, like, you know, reaching out to every single nonprofit individually, we decided to, like, you know, reach out to them collectively. So we sent out, like, one survey to um, all the nonprofits um, just to find out what their needs were. And in the provider survey that we sent out, 50 providers participated. And one of the questions we asked them was what their clients' greatest needs are. And the top need cited was behavioral health, um, second was affordable housing, and third was financial assistance. Um, and 80% of providers said that as a result of COVID, their agency incurred additional expenses in 2021 that were not budgeted for. Uh, the main unbudgeted um, items um, were increased demand for services, staffing costs and IT related expenses. Uh, we had also asked them a question on how they would use a one time investment of funding because, you know, this ARPA funding, you know, it's a one time thing. It's not going to be an ongoing, you know, funding source. And overwhelmingly, they said capacity building was cited as their first use for one time funding, followed by IT infrastructure and program support. And of the 50 providers that participated um, in the survey, over 8 million was requested with an agency average of 160,000 requests. Um, so 
I don't know if you know, but like a couple of weeks back, we went to City Council. Um, City Council wanted to know uh, potential options of where they could put their ARPA funding. Um, and rental assistance was one of them or human slash human services. Um, as you know, the King County um, EPRAP program, which is the landlord uh, rent assistance program, um, um, they um, we reached out to them. We don't know which landlords have applied or how much funding they've got. Uh, we know that for individual tenants, it's a lottery program. And so, you know, that is like, you know, we know they're very behind in payments and processing applications. Uh, and so at this moment, we really, and so I think when we went to council, I think they wanted us to be like, this is where the need is. And right now at this moment, we just don't understand how all these pieces fit together. We know that between federal funding, county funding, state funding, city funding, um, it's it's not out in the community yet. So we're really trying to uh, um, get an idea. We want to be targeted and strategic in our approach. You know, if if see, you know to at least go to seat council to be like, okay, this is where we see the need. So we know that the the King County program does not guarantee that all those in need will be helped. Uh, we know that simply no program is going to be able to do that. So right now, um, we are just trying to understand the needs and then potentially find the unmet needs in the community. And so even with our rental assistance providers, we know that there are certain um, housing complexes that they help. And if we know that one's been completely taken care of by King County, then we can know that we can kind of focus efforts elsewhere um, in the community. So that is where we're at relating to ARPA funding and just what we found out and what we presented to council. So it's really going to be a little bit of a wait and see approach. And ultimately, it's up to council as to where they decide to put that money. Um, but we're, we'll, we'll see what they have to say when, when we report back to them. So hopefully we'll get clarity soon. And that is it. Um, yeah. So my dog's barking. Any questions on that? Um, so are you making an ask or are you presenting what your survey results and? Yeah, um, so as far right now, um, we're not making an ask as yet. Like, so I think um, we're just trying to figure out with regards to, we know that rental assistance is a, big, is a big one. It's really up to city council as to where they put that funds, but we're just trying to figure out like where that need is and potential areas to give them at least options is, is a nice sense of where, you know, of what they're hoping for us to provide them. Move into commissioner reports. Um, you, um, the only thing I have is, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. The only thing I have is I am now on the board of directors for the Issaquah Philharmonic Orchestra. Yeah. I am the at-large member. Congratulations. So I, I would encourage everyone to attend their fall concert, and I will be willing to share that information with you in the future. What instrument do you play? Yeah, so I was going to ask, Chair. Do what? What instrument? I do not. That's why. That's why I'm the at-large person. They wanted somebody from the community who cared about the community, and they asked me to serve, and they voted and approved me to be on the board. I did play the piano for a while, but not much. Well, thanks. I'm representing everybody in Sammamish, so we're going to make it work. Good job. <laughs> Very good. Did any of you received a letter from the garage? I mean, the um, yeah, the garage in Issaquah, following up our meeting with the people last month. They're wishing to look at um, the possibility of having a similar organization here and they have a meeting coming up uh, next week and they would like to have I don't know whether speakers or listeners or uh, just to be part of the meeting to to hear what's going on or add some insight to it 
I was thinking that maybe Terry would be interested in that because of his youth background there. But we can't have more than um, three of us go for the purpose of then it, we wouldn't have to worry about being a public notice commission meeting. Well, yeah, if you let me know the details. Um, I'll send what I have. Okay. But you didn't get notices yourselves. No, I don't believe so. Okay. I just, when I first looked at it, I said, okay, how's the boys and girls going to feel about it for their teen center? And what's the Y program um, going to change because of something like this? And would it be in the south end of town so that it picks up on the skyline as compared to the East Lake? And anyway, I was thinking of the competition for things. And of course, the, the money cost is finding something and either sharing it with another organization or associating with another organization, but it's part of the Youth Eastside service that's, no, it was Friends of Youth, wasn't it, Terry, that started the garage, or at least was the fiscal agent for the garage. Yeah, I believe that's correct. I mean, what we I try to tell folks who are in that situation where they're starting a new project in a community is they should talk to the folk, other folks who are doing it. I mean, doesn't, yeah. You know, they can partner with them. Maybe they bring a new facet to the program that the Boys and Girls Club or the Y doesn't have, and they want to partner. And then, then that way they can even get them to send their folks to their this program because it's not actually in competition, you know. Well, I, or vice versa. I know the Boys and Girls Club team participation dropped when they had to stop the Battle of the Bands. Um, so I. I don't know. Older teens just have different interest than uh, going to the Boys and Girls Club now. Mm -hmm. well, it was great when they had the Battle of the Bands, but they dropped it. They had still have leadership programs for teens, but it's not a drop-in center such as what the garage is. Okay. Anybody else want to have a copy of the uh, what they're looking for? I believe it's. Can you just Sorry. email it out? Yeah. You, Can you uh, send it out? I'll forward it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And whoever goes, I'd love to hear about it. Okay. Like I said, it shouldn't be more than three people that represent us because because then we're not having to worry about public notices and being a commission meeting. Okay. Um, I just wanted to just highlight, I, it's really striking to me that your survey, Rita, said that they had one thing, their number one need for one-time funding was capacity building, because that's what my organization does. So I'm just like, wow, that's really interesting. Right? Um, yes, I'm, I'm happy. Um, I'm in a meeting. I, I don't know if, I don't see why I couldn't forward those on to you. I just have to check with my peers. Um, but yes, it, it was a... Yeah. yeah, I'd love to see who, I mean, reach out to those, or potentially reach out if we have services that they could use. But as I, I think I mentioned at the last meeting, uh, City of Bellevue got a million dollars from Amazon. Did you guys hear about that? And they're setting aside uh, money to do a East Side nonprofit cohort, which I mentioned last time. And so this is why I wanted to hear about these folks, because they might be good folks for the cohort. The cohort is being focused on BIPOC led and serving, but not necessarily exclusive, as long as they're serving um, and small emerging organizations. But again, we're being flexible. Some folks got a, a bunch of money for COVID, but that's not their normal. Um, and also groups like CISC might have a small office on the east side, <clears throat> even though they're part of a bigger organization and could use the support on the east side. So. Anyway, Rita, I'll touch base with you about getting the word out. We're not going to do it till next year, so we have some time. But um, my team wants to start doing outreach and getting connected with some of these organizations. So I love that. And and so just so you know, Commissioner Nishioka, um, I really did stress when we sent out that survey that we also not only send it to the organizations that we currently fund. Oh, it's about, yes, because like then we have this usual suspect and like getting to those grassroots yes, people that's that. Cool. So, yes. Yeah, so it was a, quite a wide net. So, yeah. 
Yeah, 50 um, respondents is good for. Yeah. For so, yeah, I'm happy to touch base with you offline. Yeah. Uh, looking at the calendar that we have, um, no meeting in August. September has the potential of the Joint East Side Human Services. Uh, we have the seniors in October. We have domestic violence in November. We haven't had a chance to really talk about how how these panelists have affected us. I think my I was affected today by the fact that this didn't talk to that. You know, it was like, oh, surprises uh, on services and what could we do to um, pull in communications or be some kind of service there. And the other thing, and just general discussion, even with my some member seniors, is where is affordable housing that hasn't happened? You know, where is a lot of the the things that were part of the city plans in the past that just haven't? You know, where's that town center? Do we need to we meet with a planning commission to learn what's what on affordable housing? Or you know, with the parks and recreation as to, okay, you're doing great little magic shows and bingo stuff for youth and family, but where is something for the older population, the seniors? Um, yeah, I'm not pushing some of seniors and I'm just saying, okay, that's a group that's missing from the parks and recreation, unless you talk about taking your chair up to Beaver Lake Park for a concert. Um, anyway. I'd like to have some discussion on that at some point, if you think about it. So Anybody? the side human services meeting, is that online or is that in person? Um, so Commission Mayor, like I, we're not quite sure. We tend to be about airmarked it for September. We think it may be October um, and when we have that. And who knows? Um, you know, yeah, uh, I, I'm not quite sure because things change. So, uh, yeah. Definitely, oh, maybe, right? Yeah. Well, Bellevue is open for City Hall. Or look. Say again, Stan. Are we considering or looking at a the joint meeting being held here, maybe? Um. So. Yes, um, I think it's all up in the air, Commissioner Gano. Um, so um, I think I would like to propose it, but I think people are going to be like, we need somewhere more central. And I think they think of Sammamish as being a little bit out of the way, which I am like, listen, we schlep ourselves everywhere, you know, like get over it. But well, um, I mean, yeah. well, think about it. The only people that we're not central to is Bellevue. <laughs> Issaquah, Redmond, and us are all right here. We slept to uh, Bellevue all the time. Yeah, well, Kirkland. So we've been to Kirkland too a couple times. Yes, yeah, so maybe they should uh, consider it. Oh, we don't have any pool. Maybe that's it. We don't have any what? Sorry. We we don't have the 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 muscle to bring him in here. It's okay. Oh. Oh, no, 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 like just saying like, you know, I mean, I know we'd show them a good time and we'd have great food and like it would be like a dinner party. We'd have like music playing and then um, I will, I will, I will, I will throw it out there. I will. Yes. Um, why not? If you don't ask, you don't get. So, yes, I will definitely ask and propose. Yes. For you sure. know, you know, maybe we should uh, get an invitation from our mayor to the other Human Services Commission to invite them here. Do we have City Hall opening in September? Um, so I do know from yesterday's um, council meeting, they show some tentative plans and um, the hope is, is to open, but we don't know quite what that looks like. And I don't know if it's gonna be a modified opening or uh, yeah, so it's still all up in the air. So uh, um, yeah, as clear as mud. <laughs> Meanwhile, there's a question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Any right, other business to come before this group? All that good, good for the order there. Okay, then we don't meet again until maybe September somewhere doing something with other people. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
That's right. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn at 829? I'll move. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you. I don't think we need to vote. We'll just call it. <laughs> Have a good August, everybody. Thank you. Okay. Thank Bye you. All. Bye. Take care, everyone. Have a lovely Bye. August. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you.